Is my makeup okay? Oh. Historical events reveal that demonic possession was present before Jesus Christ. And demons, who are they? Where are they? And what caused them to fade away in history? I'm Linnea Quigley, and you're watching Paranormal Truth. Hello, my name is Patrick Allen, and this is Linnea Quigley's Paranormal Truth, a series of films where we delve into the paranormal world of the unknown. In this episode, we are going to investigate the scary world of demonic possession. Can an evil intelligence enter and take control of our body? What makes one susceptible, and how can it be prevented? What are the three stages of possession? Was the film The Exorcist fact or fiction? Does the Catholic Church really perform exorcisms in the 21st century? All this and more will be answered in this very episode. What about exorcisms, are they for real, and have you ever actually seen uh, a diabolical possession? Well, I've seen more than one of them, and I've uh, been uh, part of a team of uh, exorcists as well, and uh, the devil certainly makes his presence known when when he's provoked, uh, provoked rather, when you try to kick him out, he doesn't, he resists, he doesn't like that. And you know, the uh, part of the exorcism says, quid stas and resist us, why do you stay and resist? You know, and, 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 and it's, it's hard for you to kick against the goad, as our Lord said that to St. Paul, but this is said to the devil. So, uh, and the devil responds to different, different uh, things. It depends on the devil. You know, there are, it's important to understand the devils are fallen angels. And the angels uh, are, each angel is distinguished from every other angel by being a different species. Now, there are nine choirs of angels but even if every angel within the choir of angels, we're talking about billions, of, mm -hmm. here's God's creative, that each angel is a different species from every other angel. Yeah, because with and us, matter differentiates us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, soul, the soul is in, my soul is in, animates my body, your soul, my, and so, but we're all the same family, we're all the same species. Mm -hmm. But each angel is a different species. So, they, they, and they all have their own story, and they all have their own history. Dr. Richard Gallagher is an Ivy League educated board certified psychiatrist who teaches at Columbia University and New York Medical College and is part of a team that tries to help fight Satan's minions. This wasn't part of Gallagher's career goals. While he studied medicine at Yale, he knew about biblical accounts of demonic possession, but thought that they were in ancient cultures. His attempt to get a handle on mental disorders like epilepsy made him stumble onto exorcism. He proudly calls himself a man of science. Gallagher has become something else. The go-to guy for an ever-expanding network of exorcists in the United States. He says that he has seen evidence. Victims suddenly speaking perfect Latin. Sacred objects flying off the shelves. People displaying hidden knowledge or secrets about people that they could have not possibly known. I'm Dr. Richard Gallagher. I'm a board-certified psychiatrist. I'm also a uh, professor at New York Medical College in psychiatry and on the faculty at uh, Columbia. About 25 plus years ago, I found myself uh, being asked by clergy of many different faiths to uh, investigate and give them my psychiatric opinion about people that they thought might be demonically attacked. I went into my conversation with this priest a little on the skeptical side and somewhat to my surprise he liked that. He said, well, if we didn't think you were skeptical, Dr. Gallagher, we wouldn't have wanted to use you. Well, I guess he had heard about me and that's, that's why he came to ask my opinion. About a woman who was claiming that she was beat up by invisible forces. She would even have these bruises spontaneously appear. She appeared to me to be completely sane. 
and I'd never seen a case like that before. It didn't seem to be explainable on the basis of any medical or psychiatric pathology. She and her husband were devout Catholics and they believed it was kind of uh, evil spirits. I didn't have a great deal of interest in getting involved in this, but you know, as a physician, I really don't like the idea of seeing somebody in tremendous pain or tremendous confusion. I was asked to comment whether there could be any psychiatric illness, whether she was being abused, whether she, this was her imagination, etc. And I had to conclude that there was no medical reason why this would happen. I felt that she was being attacked because in fact, she was a very holy person. I believe in science. I trained at an American medical school. I use scientific, the results of scientific studies every day of my life. I believe in evolution, I believe in the Big Bang, I believe in quantum theory. I just have had a rare window or a rare opportunity to study these things a little more rigorously than most doctors would have. With a possession, you have to have, at least in the Catholic Church, what is called moral certainty. And there are very strict criteria, and it really depends on evidence. The essence of a possession is a person going into a trance and a demonic sounding voice coming out of them. <laughs> attacking the people, uh, attacking religion, usually using very crude and violent language. Like, leave her alone, she's ours, this type of thing. Superhuman strength. Knowing secrets of people that a human being could never know otherwise. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. She was a Satanist, a self-professed high priestess of a Satanic cult. The night before I first met her, uh, I was in my bedroom with my wife at about 3 a.m. And we had two cats. And these two cats just went completely berserk in a way that we had never seen before. And we were mystified. And the next day, the priest introduced me to Julia. And the first words out of Julia's mouth were, well, Doc, how did you like those cats last night? Now, I'd never met the woman before. She would often tell me how people's parents had died. For instance, she told me, uh, I know your mother died of ovarian cancer, which was true. And once I was on the telephone line, on a landline in this case, with the other exorcist. Now remember, Julia was not in the phone conversation. This was not a conference call or anything. We actually knew where she was at the time. She was about a thousand miles away. And uh, that same voice came in over the phone line, said the same kind of thing. She's ours, leave her alone. So I said to the priest, I said, did you hear that? And he said to me, yeah, the evil spirit can even interrupt our phone conversation which I found pretty remarkable. It was pretty creepy, but I also found it pretty remarkable. She was um, completely demonically possessed. It just doesn't happen out of the blue. It's not like your average person all of a sudden is gonna wake up and be possessed. There is pretty much always an explanation. They have turned to evil in a very explicit way. 
For instance, in Julia's case, the context was obvious. She had turned to Satanism. These are not fringe beliefs. And then there are countries around the world where Haiti, Madagascar, for instance, everybody in the country believes in the devil and everybody believes in possessions. And then throughout history, most cultures, certainly most major religions, they've always had a belief. In fact, they have an official belief in evil spirits and the ability of evil spirits occasionally to attack people. Critics often ask for uh, a ludicrous level of, quote, proof. You can't do lab experiments. And in my experience, many critics, they've never seen a genuine case. They've never even spoken to an official exorcist. I don't think that's very scientific of them. Many, many people in the mental health field are more open to healthy spirituality than they were in the past. We have, I think, moved past an era heavily influenced by Freud's atheism, where psychiatry was actually hostile to religion and spirituality. I don't want to prevent people who need psychiatric help from getting it. But then there are these rare cases. No amount of medical help is going to deliver them of an evil spirit. There are definite criteria, there's definite evidence. Although the evidence, while massive throughout history, is of an historical nature. If that's not good enough for you, well, you know, you're never really going to be able to understand this field. One of Satan's schemes is to possess humans. The New Testament writings speak of several episodes where Jesus drove the demons out of people. In the 11th chapter of Luke, verse 14, Jesus was casting out a demon from a mute man. When the demon was gone, the man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. In the first chapter of Mark, verse 39, Jesus went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. Catholic exorcists distinguish between ordinary satanic demonic activity or influence an extraordinary satanic or demonic activity, which may take any of six different forms, ranging from total control by Satan or demons to submitting voluntarily. The first form is possession. This is when Satan and demons take full possession of a person's body without their consent. This usually happens as a result of a person's actions, which leads to a heightened vulnerability to Satan's grasp. The amount of irrational, obsessive thoughts increases, usually ending in a suicidal reaction. Well, here's something you don't see every night. First-hand accounts of real-life exorcisms from Catholic priests trained by the Vatican. They say they've seen demons in action. Take a look. I command you, Satan, enemy of human salvation, Acknowledge the justice and goodness of God the Father. A voice comes out of the living room. Get out. Who by his righteous judgment has damned your pride and enemy. His back starts to arch and he's like. Depart from the servant of God, whom the Lord has made in his own image. So he picks up the book and that baby voice again. He goes, I read this book. Many will dismiss the idea of the devil taking possession of a person. But the priest in this tiny town near the border of Ohio and Indiana is now known all over the world for his work around just that. He never even wanted to become an exorcist and says what he's seen isn't far off the movies. When I saw a person levitate during an exorcism during my training in Rome, you know, I think I was sitting there with my jaw wide open. Christ. No! But this vision claims to capture the authentic exorcism of a woman who'd suffered abuse before turning to drugs and prostitution. So when an exorcism is performed, the exorcist is in charge of the scene and nobody should interject or do anything. When I was appointed in 05, I became one of only about 12 officially appointed exorcists in the United States. 
Father Vincent Lampert is one of America's few Vatican-trained exorcists, living there for three months to learn how it's done. So during my time in Rome, I set in on 40 exorcisms and was able to learn firsthand again the church's ministry to those that up against the demonic. His stories of witnessing the devil at work as a qualified exorcist are nothing short of haunting. As soon as I started praying, she lunged at me like a wild dog. She's like, Whoa! Oh my God. I think I jumped back five feet and this voice that came out of her mouth said, well, who's he? He has no power over us. That's what happened when he was trying to help a woman who'd become possessed at the hands of childhood trauma, raped by her father. And I went over and laid my hands on her head and started praying. And then the demon started laughing uncontrollably at me and says, you can't get rid of us. We've been here too long and you're not strong enough. So you remember the sound. That's what the voice sounded like. Oh, yeah. Usually the manifestation is always you can't get rid of us, we've been here too long. Again, it's that sense of wanting to instill fear. Lampert uses various rituals, I... including insufflation, a breathing prayer, which with one woman roused the devil in a frightening way. The chair flew back and hit the side of the altar. The person flew up out of the chair and you heard a shriek, scream. I mean, hearing that happen and visualizing that happen, I just, the cynic in me says, I can't imagine that being a plausible thing to happen, for someone to fly off a chair and... I mean, I just breathe, and you would have thought that they were hit with a hurricane-force wind. The chair just went back like that, and then the person, you hear the shriek as they, they come up out of the chair and then fall on the floor. So that 100%, that's what happened? Yes, ab absolutely. That's frightening. Father Lampert tells me he's receiving about 1,800 calls, emails and letters every year from people all over the world who believe they're possessed. More than half of those, he says, come from people who aren't even Catholic or religious at all. When I was first appointed, I would get maybe three or four calls a week. Now I get like 35 calls a week. This massive spike in requests, he thinks, is due to religion diminishing around the world. Because faith is in decline, when people experience something in their lives that they can't really figure out, then it leads them to believe that maybe it's something evil or demonic. But it's not as simple as believing you're possessed and calling an exorcist. The Catholic Church has strict protocols and processes that priests must follow before deeming an exorcism to be appropriate. Exorcists are trained to be skeptics. I should be the last person to believe that a person is possessed. Every other possible explanation needs to be exhausted before I make that determination. The very first step of the protocol would be for the person to have some type of psychiatric evaluation. Those wanting help then have to answer a series of questions covering their psychological history and whether they've had addiction issues. They're also asked if they have had any experience or history of engaging in the occult. Witchcraft, black magic, magicians, fortune tellers, crystals, wizards or game boards. Other questions include, have you ever tried to communicate with spirits, demons or the devil itself? And do you truly want to be free of the evil influences you believe are presently affecting you? Will you do what must be done? I witnessed eyes rolled in the back of the head. I've seen eyes turn completely black where there's just nothing there but like total darkness foaming at the mouth. The Catholic Church doesn't allow filming of exorcisms to protect the identity of those afflicted but others not sanctioned by the church have been. Exorcisms don't take place on a dead-end street at midnight in an abandoned house during a thunderstorm. That's where you'd normally do an exorcism. Father Lampert yeah, always, always executes the exorcism in a sacred space, like the church itself. So I would have the book, I would have a crucifix, would come in and then immediately begin doing the prayer of the church. He'll then command the demon to depart. His righteous judgment has damned your pride and envy. At that point in the exorcism, if you see that disturbing behaviour, what do you do to counteract that? Do I just continue, I stay focused on the prayer of the church and I watch and observe everything that's taking place. And if certain parts of the ritual seem to be more effective than others, I just take a mental note of that. Since I have done exorcisms, I am an exorcist. 
Three and a half hours drive north, Father Michael Maginot has conducted exorcisms on 15 different people, some needing more than one session. Kind of surprising that words would have an effect on, you know, a demon. I cast you out. But it does. They, they hate it. They can't stand the prayers. They can't stand being condemned. Be gone and stay far away from this creature of God. Father Maginot performed his most high profile exorcism on a mother and her three children who lived in a home right here in the town of Gary, south of Chicago. After making headlines as the portal to hell, the house was demolished. This is where the family believes they became possessed. What started as persistent swarms of flies on the porch transpired into strange noises at night and ultimately the mother's 12-year-old daughter levitating above her bed, unconscious. The last night we stayed in the house, that's when it was throwing my children around. Within months of moving into this rental home with her kids, Latoya Amons knew something wasn't right. It picked up a lamp from out of my bedroom and threw it into the living room. It was throwing chairs. They were throwing chairs. Father Maginot was called to the house to speak with the mum, finding what he believed to be several signs of demonic possession, including unexplainable footprints around the house. I went to the bathroom, I went to the kitchen. You know, if there was a leak or something, they, they weren't there. They were just around her, you know, but they were wet and I don't remember seeing them before. During that conversation, were there any sort of key red flags that made you concerned that this was something? Took my crucifix, put it on her, she began convulsing. And then I took it off and she stopped convulsing. And I said, you are possessed. You have an aversion to holy objects. What's claimed to have happened here at the local hospital is disturbing and backed up by medical staff who say they witnessed it in this report. The seven-year-old son started making growling sounds while his eyes rolled back into his head. His older brother then walked up a wall backwards, flipping over his grandmother. The nurses were standing in the door and they bagged up saying, oh my God, oh my God. Whose room is this? The children's grandmother, Rosa Campbell, gave police a tour through the house which officers recorded. She saw it forming. She describes a series of violent occurrences. And pick him up and throw him into this deep freezer, head first. Like nobody's gonna believe this, Toya. I knew it. They're gonna think everybody's crazy. And that's the lingering question. Do demons exist? And do they inhabit the souls of people around us? What do you say to people who don't think demons are real? There is no other explanation for certain things. The role of the church is not to impose, but to propose. So one of the reasons I like to speak out on the topic of exorcism is just to help educate people with what the church actually believes and teaches. And then what people do with that is ultimately up to them. Nearly 50 years after The Exorcist, the subgenre of exorcism films pioneered by William Friedkin's 1973 landmark film is still going strong. Not that exorcism was unknown in movies prior to The Exorcist, but The Exorcist spotlighted the phenomenon of possession and deliverance in an unprecedented way. In the year 1949, Bill Blatty was an undergraduate at Georgetown University, the oldest Je Jesuit school in the country. While in his religious class, his religious instructor told him a story about a demonic possession and exorcism of a 14-year-old boy. Now, this story was widely publicized. It was on the front page of the Washington Post and a number of other newspapers. And the story flatly stated that there was a 14-year-old boy in Silver, Springs, Silver Spring, Maryland, who was possessed by the devil and exorcised by uh, a group of priests in, at Alexian Brothers Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. Blatty, and I guess everyone in his class, felt 
that if this story was true, if this could possibly be true, it would be religious nirvana. And so he set out to try and get as much information about it as he could. And of course, the church would say nothing. The church would not, and rightly so, you know, to maintain the privacy of the family. Uh, they gave out, in fact, whenever they were asked, a lot of false, incorrect information. They said that this happened in Silver Spring, Maryland. It actually happened in a smaller town nearby called Cottage City, Maryland. Um, but the church did everything it could to protect the family and the boy. The boy um, was evidently successfully exercised and he then later in life went to work for NASA and he worked for NASA for 25 years and retired owning a lot of NASA patents for his inventions. Uh, the family was Lutheran. They weren't Catholic. They went to their Lutheran minister who said, we don't have anything to deal with this young man's affliction, uh, so try the Catholic Church. <laughs> Which they did at the Washington, D.C. diocese. Now, as I say, Blatty couldn't get any of the facts. So he decided to write his novel as fiction. The Exorcist is a work of fiction. Whether you believe in possession and exorcism is totally up to you. Um, it has to do with the mystery of faith, but none of us have any of these answers. None of us, nobody. No one who's ever lived, none of the greatest philosophers who ever lived know if there's a heaven or a hell or God or angels and demons. It is a matter of your belief system or no belief system. But I think one of the reasons you're here tonight is because we're all curious about the possibility of the supernatural. I certainly was. Well, I hope you find what you're looking for in your struggle with darkness. Whether you believe in demons or not. I myself, I exercise regularly. Unlike Linda, I'm Linnea Quigley and you're watching Paranormal Truth.